Susan Jacoby, welcome. You're the author of the new book, Never Say Die, with the subtitle of The Myth and Marketing of the New Old Age. So what is the myth of the new old age? The myth of the new old age is that we are all, and by we, I really mean people who are not old now, the aging boomers, people who are in their 50s and early 60s now and in their 40s, that our old age is going to be lived in a way that's totally different from the way in which old age has been lived in the past, that we are going to all be skydiving <laughs> centenarians, I like to think of, of it As that a former way. president? Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that, we are, that we are simply going to get older, but not actually old. Mm -hmm. And so why do you think the culture's invested in sugarcoating old age? Well, it's very interesting. Now, when I was growing up, like all of the oldest boomers in the 1950s, I would say that attitudes toward old age were negative in a particular way. Just old age was just something that started the minute a man retired, mm -hmm. and he returned home to bother his wife. And her only role was to be the grandmother to her grandchildren. And that was the whole idea, not just of old age, but just of anybody mm -hmm. who was retired in their 60s. Now I think we ha we've had a great corrective to that, uh, which the AARP has had a role in, in the sense that we now understand that people over 65 can do a lot of things and that their only role isn't just lying around the house watching TV and looking after the grandkiddies. But there is a kind of new ageism, I think, that's taken over, which is this. It's great to be old as long as you don't exhibit any of the typical problems of old age and Old age is also has been very much redefined in terms of young old age, which sociologists and doctors call people in their 60s and 70s who are basically pretty healthy, even if they've had all kinds mm -hmm. of diseases like cancer and heart disease. And old, old age in the late 80s and 90s, of whom so many more boomers are going to live to that era, the typical problems of people in old, old age are downplayed as if 90, well, I decided to write this book when I went to a panel at the World Science Festival a few years ago titled 90 is the New 50. And I thought, does anybody really believe that? And the answer is, is that there are a lot of people in their 40s, 50s, and 60s who do believe that. So that, so that we've, re, we, we've there, it's a new kind of more subtle form of ageism in that it's great to be old as long as you don't have any of the typical problems of people who are really old. You use the phrase uh, old, old. What, what do you mean by that? Is that well, a old, old, it's a phrase that's used by doctors mm -hmm. and sociologists. And it's used basically for people in their late 80s and 90s as opposed to those in their 60s and 70s. And it's, used, it's quite right to make that distinction. Mm -hmm. Because people in their 90s, in terms of health and abilities, I'm not talking about exceptions. I'm talking about the majority of people. To talk about them as though they were the same as people in their 60s is as absurd as to talk about people in their 60s as if they were in their 30s. Mm -hmm. Now, there are people in their 60s who might like to think that they're in their 30s, but they're deluded. <laughs> You say that the two overwhelming problems of old, old age are health that worsens over time, which is inevitable, and the tendency for most people to get poorer. Um, and that you, su you suggest there's some collective action that um, we should take in response to that. W what are those key points? Well, health, there's not much we can do about. And there are lucky people who, who don't, whose health doesn't constantly worsen over time. But I think those of us who have parents who've survived into their 90s and grandparents, as I have, know that the typical person has to deal with many more health problems over time. And, and this, by the way, the problems of the oldest old have to be looked at as not entirely but they are a huge women's issue because mm -hmm. right now the vast majority of people over 85 are women. And everybody gets poorer over time except people like, say, Warren Buffett. <laughs> I'm sure he's going to be well fixed at 92. But women in particular mm -hmm. get poorer because there are lots of things that happen to total income with the death of a husband. Uh, now this is true of women today, uh, most of whom didn't work outside their mm -hmm. home who were in their 90s. 
but it's also going to be true to some degree of boomer women because women have more interrupted work patterns than, than men do, which reduces your, the total amount of either pension or social security income over a lifetime. So people get poorer as they get older. And, and moreover, this is also connected with worth, worse health because people need many more services as they get older that cost money, most of which none of our social service programs, which, which the Republicans are now so eager to cut and, and certain Democrats as well, pay for already. So that people's needs in terms of the assistance they need if they'd like to go on living independently become greater at a time when their income becomes less. Well, in fact, uh, you mentioned in the book that you had a friend who, when you s told her you were writing a book about aging and old age, she said, ah, oh, you're writing a book about women. Yeah. For the exact reason that you say that statistically women live longer and have a more problematic right, older they're... age. Right, and, and people in this age group, uh, uh, among, among women in their 90s, Social Security makes up about 90% of their income. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not a lot of money ar left around by then. And I think I, I would like to say something also that I often forget in interviews. I think that one of the problems here in thinking about this rationally is that we do live in a society in which the idea that people ought to be able to save enough to finance a 30-year retirement, that there is something wrong with you if you can't do that. And this is ridiculous. When the Social Security Act was signed in 1935, the average life expectancy was 62. And people weren't able to save enough for their old age then. That's why Social Security was enacted. But no one foresaw a time when right now all those baby boomers who are turning 65, in 20 years they're going to be 85, and there'll be 8.5 million of them. Saving enough money to finance a 10-year retirement and a 30-year retirement if you have an average income, if you're not rich, are two different things. It is not a matter of moral turpitude if the average family in this country cannot save enough to finance a 30-year retirement. And furthermore, there's a real question of do we want a society in which, let's say, a 45 or 50-year-old parent says to their kid in college, well, I can't help you. I'm putting aside money for long-term care. Is that a healthy society? I don't think so. Well, some of the consequences, perhaps, of growing up, um, as I did, as you did, in an age of medical miracles, um, I was just a little girl when the polio vaccine came along. Um, there's always been antibiotics. Uh, we have fake hips. We have fake knees. We have organ tra transplants. That's the medical norm now. How has, I mean, people who have taken advantage or, or not been disadvantaged because they have had access to this kind of care would, I think, assume that that is, you know, a good thing. But I th you paint a sort of overall picture of your book that these things do have consequences because they prolong life um, beyond what our social network, our social uh, safety network was able to provide or was created to provide. Well, well, that's true, uh, but I think I think they have they have other consequences too. Uh, I mean, antibiotics, yes, they do. People people who would have died of pneumonia at 65 if they got a bad case of pneumonia don't anymore because there are antibiotics. Talking now about in the older age group, but I think there's something else about medical miracles that really creates a problem in thinking realistically about old age is that. Things like my first medical memory is standing in line for the Salk vaccine, too. I am just old enough to remember life in the summer before the Salk mm -hmm. vaccine in the early 50s when your parents would never let you go out to go swimming because they were so terrified of polio. That was eradicated overnight. I think because we've grown up amid these medical miracles, we don't realize that some of the things that kill people in old age inevitably Alzheimer's disease, for example, or forms of cancer that hit in old age, or they, if they don't hit in old age, your immune system becomes too weak to overcome them, that these things are far more complicated. They require, will require, if they are ever to be 
ameliorated. They require research at the basic biomedical level, which is now going on, and they are very connected. They're, the more Alzheimer's research is being done, they had assumed when they started it that, that a, a disease this common, and nearly half of all people over 85 have it, something else nobody likes to hear. Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> uh, 